It's been a while, welcome back. As you may have guessed from the title, today we're gonna work on pathfinding algorithms. Let's not waste any time. We're starting this project by creating an empty window. We're using SFML for graphics. Ha! It's almost as if I've done this before. Before we start working on pathfinding, we need to work on the map. The map is gonna be a matrix of cells, so we're using a nested for loop to draw it. I'm leaving an empty space on our web to write important stuff later, like love confessions. Anyway, now we need to add the ability to change the map. And for that, I made a two-dimensional array. I'm using type dev so that we don't have to write this monstrosity every time we want to use it. For now, every cell on the map can either be empty or have a wall. Once we press any mouse button, we get the position of the mouse. Then we check to see if the mouse is inside the map. If so, we calculate the position of the cell under the cursor. And finally, we change the cell based on the pressed button. In code, it looks something like this. Now it may look like it's working, but watch what happens when we try to draw a circle. That doesn't quite look like a circle. Why is this happening? We're updating the program 60 times per second. In other words, our FPS is 60. And when we move the mouse really fast, our program can process every position of the cursor. Because on one frame the cursor is here, then on the next frame it's here. How do we fix it? To fix this, we can use the line function, which is mx plus b. Let's focus on the slope because b is just the starting position of the mouse in this case. To calculate the slope, we simply calculate the horizontal and vertical distances and divide the second by the first. And since the longer distance in this case is horizontal, every time we move x by 1, we move y using the line formula. And while we're moving, we'll change the cells along the way. In cases where the vertical distance is longer, we will use the line formula to find the x in terms of y. The code may be slightly different, but the idea is the same. Oh yeah, baby! Now we can start working on the pathfinding algorithms. Every path has a starting point and a finishing point, which is why I'm adding two more cell types. In order to add them to the map, the user needs to press the mouse button while holding a certain key. Here's the starting cell, and here's the finishing cell. I feel like I forgot something. Yeah, this thing. To fix this, we need to store the starting and finishing positions in variables. And before we set the current cell to be the starting cell, we're gonna make the current starting cell empty. Same thing applies to the finishing cell. There we go. Now our map has a starting cell and a finishing cell. But how do we find the shortest path between them? I'm glad you asked. The first algorithm we're gonna use is called Brett's first search. I'm gonna call it BFS for short. Before I explain to you how it works, we need to know something about queues. A queue is a data structure that's open on both sides. So when we add a new element to the queue, it is inserted on one side. And when we take an element out of the queue, it is removed from the other side. This is called first in first out, or FIFO for short. That's why it's called a queue, because it works like a queue in real life. Now when it comes to BFS, we're gonna make a queue of cells that need to be checked. At the start, the queue consists of only one cell, which is the starting cell. We also mark that cell as visited so we don't have to check it again. Then on each step of the search, we take the first cell out of our queue. If it's the finishing cell, we stop the search. If it's not, we get the cells adjacent to it and include the unvisited ones in the queue. We also mark them as visited. Then we take the next cell out of our queue, repeat the same process, and so on until we reach the finishing cell or until the queue becomes empty, in which case there is no path between the starting cell and the finishing cell. Turning this into code was surprisingly simple. Every time we update the map, we mark every visited cell as unvisited and run the search again. And as you can see, it works. We're not calculating the path for now, but you can already see how the algorithm works in practice. For the path, I made a map called previous cell. I'm using the standard pairs here because using the SFML vectors is giving me an error. The idea is that every time we get the adjacent cells of a certain cell, we set that cell to be their parent cell. Then once we reach the goal, we can just go back to the parent cell, then go to the parent cell of that parent cell, and eventually, after going through many parent cells, we will reach the great 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 grandparent cell which is the starting cell. We'll also highlight the cells along the way. And we're done. Looks like it's working perfectly. But you know, seeing the result is not nearly as satisfying as seeing the process behind it. So I changed the search function so that it only makes one check when it's called. And now instead of running the entire search at once, we're checking some number of cells per frame. 
This is fascinating. By looking at this, you can clearly see that this algorithm is pretty straightforward. I think it's time we start using this empty space right here. I'm planning to show the length of the path, the total number of cells that were checked, and how much time it took to find the path. I'm using the draw text function which I used many times in my previous projects. And I don't see any reason to not use it again. Alright, now we need some data to show here. For the total checks, we're just incrementing the variable by 1 every time we check a cell. And we do a similar thing for the path length. Now when it comes to getting the search time, we're using the steady clock from the chrono library. Once the search is complete, we simply subtract the start time of the search from the current time. There we go. Perfect. Before we move on to the next algorithm, I want to make the movement 8 directional instead of 4. We just need to change the adjacent cell's getting code so that it checks diagonally as well. And it works. Kind of. Okay, what's happening is that when we're checking the diagonally located cells, we're ignoring these cells. We need to allow the diagonal movement only when there are no cells here and here. I changed the code so now we're checking all 8 directions to see if they're valid or not and then, on a separate loop, we're checking the diagonal movement and adding the cells in our vector. And now it's fixed. Kind of. I think what's happening is that the algorithm thinks that diagonal moves have the same distance as regular ones so it doesn't see any reason to choose one over another. Yeah, why would I choose this over this if they are the same? Now we could fix it right now. Or we can start working on the second algorithm that doesn't have this problem. And in my opinion the choice is pretty obvious here. So the next algorithm is called... D D D D D Wait, hold on. Dijkstra. Dijkstra. Yeah. So how does it work? Every cell on our map will have a number. That number represents the total distance from our starting cell to that cell. In the beginning, we're gonna set that number to infinity for every cell except for the starting cell which will set to zero. Because moving from the starting cell to the starting cell requires no effort. Then we choose a cell with the lowest distance value. Right now it's the starting cell. After that, we'll look at the adjacent cells and calculate the distance between them. For these cells it's gonna be 1. And for these cells it's gonna be the square root of 2. We add the distance it takes to move from the starting cell to the cell that we're currently checking to that distance. And since we're checking the starting cell, we're gonna add 0. After that, we compare the result with the current distance value of the cell. If it's lower, we update the distance value and set a new parent cell to that adjacent cell. Then we mark the cell that we checked as visited so we don't check it again. Then we pick the next cell with the lowest distance value, for example this one, get the adjacent cells, calculate the distance, add the distance it takes to get here to that distance, update the distance value if it's lower, set a new parent cell, mark the cell as visited and so on. This was slightly more complicated than BFS but I managed to do it. I also added the ability to switch between the algorithms. Ok, right now we're using BFS. Let's switch to Dijkstra. Oh my god. It's more than 10 times slower than BFS. After some benchmarking and googling, I decided to switch to using priority queues. They work the exact same way as regular queues. But instead of mindlessly adding the new element at the end of the queue, they're placed in the queue based on how important they are. That's why they're called priority queues. So how are we gonna use them in our search? We're gonna store all of the cells in the priority queue and their importance will be based on their distance value. So the cell with the lowest distance value will be at the top of the queue. And we can just take the cell from the top of our queue instead of looking through the whole map. Hopefully that'll make the search faster. To sort the cells based on their distance value, we need to write our own class that has the function for comparison. And yes, I'm using a row pointer here because I'm too lazy to work with smart pointers. Ok, here's our map. Let's switch to Dijkstra. Well that was fast. It turns out that when we update the distance value of the cell, the priority queue is not updated. And the only way to update it is to push that cell again. But even after doing that, it still didn't fix the issue. I did eventually fix it by not doing what Wikipedia told me to do. I just stopped including every cell in the queue. And it finally worked. And there are also no unnecessary turns like in BFS. Hey, why is Dijkstra working slower than BFS? Oh, it's because I didn't optimize the code. So, are you gonna optimize the code? <laughs> yeah, funny joke, man. No, that wasn't a joke. Are you gonna optimize it? Next algorithm is called A star. Sounds promising, because at least I can spell it correctly. So, how does it work? Every cell now has an F value. That value is calculated by adding the cell's G value and its H value. Now, what the hell are those things? 
The g value is the same thing as the distance value in the Dijkstra algorithm. We calculate it by adding the cell's parents g value to the distance between them. What about the h value? It's basically the hypothetical distance from the cell to the finishing cell. And since we don't know that, otherwise we wouldn't need this algorithm. We have to estimate it. There are many ways we can do that. We can use the Manhattan distance where we just add the horizontal and vertical distance. We can use the Euclidean distance where we apply the Pythagorean theorem. I decided that since we can move in 8 directions, we need to find the distance based on that movement. And here's the formula for that. The algorithm works the same way as Dijkstra. We pick the cell with the lowest f value, calculate the g value of the adjacent cells and update them if they're lower, as well as change their parent cell. Then we mark the cell as visited and pick the next cell with the lowest f value. Turning this into code was a lot more difficult. So much that I had to drink 3 coffee cups. I also need to mention that even though it would make more sense to use cues here, I'm using vectors because it's easier and I'm lazy. Future me speaking. I did eventually try using a priority queue here, and it didn't change the speed of the algorithm whatsoever, so that was a huge waste of time. Alright, let's see how the A star algorithm performs. With easy maps, it finds the path pretty quickly, faster than the other algorithms. But when we have to move away from the finish in order to reach it, A star performs slightly worse than the other algorithms in terms of speed. However, I wouldn't compare their speed because I didn't care about optimization when writing the code. Told ya. Also, I fixed the unnecessary diagonal turns in BFS by modifying the adjacent cells getting function. That was a lot easier than I thought. When we're getting the adjacent cells, we're just gonna put the diagonally located cells at the end of the array. And now it works correctly. Okay, let's see how each algorithm will find the path for this map. Okay, what about this one? And this one. This is so beautiful. And just for fun I changed the algorithm so that they now search for the longest path. It looks interesting in a weird way. Phew, that was tough. As always the code is in the description. Big thanks to all of my awesome Patreon supporters, especially Richie Spechner and Victor Fernandez. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to- Wait, wait, wait. Are you gonna leave for another year again? Phew, no. Look, I know I messed up, but I learned my lesson and I promise this won't happen again. Uh-huh, yeah. Anyway, don't forget to join our Discord server and be sure to like and subscribe. And before I go, 